right, here we go. Um, tonight we have um, Mr. Sean Hockley on uh, to talk to us about his experiences as a football official. But before we start, uh, we have Dana Pappas that usually comes on and says a couple words. Dana? Thank you, Dennis, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, you know, kind of like during regular season for the NFL, it's Thursday night football, so that's exciting. Uh, we are excited to have tonight's speaker with us, Sean Hockley. Right before we started recording, I really, you know, I expressed my appreciation to Sean and just want to reiterate that how important it is and how lucky we are that the NFL officials are such a great group of individuals who are always willing to give back to high school officials. You know, it's funny because a lot of times we get questions about, well, how did you get, you know, how'd you get Sean Hockley? And it's one of those things, well, we asked. So yeah. it's, you know, I've never had somebody from the NFL tell us no. And we really do appreciate that because we know how busy you all are and what, what it takes to officiate at your level. So the fact that you remember to give back to all of us is just huge. And it, it shows the humility and the, you know, just the spirit of service that the NFL officials have. So Sean, thank you, Dennis and Ken. And Bob, thank you all for putting this together. And uh, I won't take up any more time, but to those of you participating, thanks for being here. And I'm sure this will be an awesome presentation. Thanks again, Sean. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dana. You're a great boss, by the way. You always have our backs. Uh, before we forget, we've got our uh, sponsor, uh, Get It Right, uh, best uh, software training program for football officials around the country. So please check out getitright.com. Uh, Sean, Personally, I want to thank you for coming on. We've all we've all watched your dad for years. I know those were big shoes, but uh, obviously you're filling them well. Dennis, you want to introduce our guest, please? Yeah, tonight, uh, Sean Hockley, he is number 80, 83. He was hired in the NFL in 2014 and promoted from back judge to referee in 2018. During that time, he's uh, worked four NFL playoff games. Before then, he worked eight bowl games, the 2011 Orange Bowl. He had 12 seasons in the Arena League and uh, worked the 2011 Arena Bowl. 2008, I believe, he worked the Arena Bowl NFL Europe. He's married, has three children, Crew Cooper Colt, and he had a birthday last week, so belated happy birthday from the New Mexico Officials Association. Uh, Thank you, Dad. Thanks for joining us, and Sean, the next hour is yours. Right on. No, thanks, Dennis. I appreciate the the welcome and and thanks for all that. You make me sound a lot better than I am. And thank you, Dana, for for everything you do on behalf of officials everywhere, and uh, and Ken and Bob and and everyone who's on the call. And I apologize for the informal nature. I'm kind of you know hidden in my dungeon of my basement right now, being the the holiday the night before the holiday weekend, and the kids are running around. So if we get interrupted, I apologize. But I'm honored to be here. I really am, and, and thank you. And Dana said something at the outset about you know NFL guys and and I want to say this at the very beginning that there's no difference between me and any of you the, the the only difference is that 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 you know the level at which we work you know when it comes to getting yelled at by you know whether it's an NFL coach or a parent on the peewee level you know human emotions are the same and it's it's brutal to, to to hear those things in your ear regardless of the level that you're at and so we're all brethren and we're all in this together and i know it's easy for sean the the guy at the you know the nfl level to say that but i truly mean it from the bottom of my heart we are we are all at least for the next hour we're all a crew we're all the same and and, and i root you guys on drop me a line anytime if there's any any time a chance i can get to, to check you out on tv or whatever you know please just say the word so so i appreciate being here and thanks for having me um, and yeah, we'll touch a little bit on some of the dad stuff, uh, uh, DB. And yeah, I think the most common thing I hear from players and coaches is, you know, you don't have your, the guns that your dad had as, but uh, my standard response, by the way, is, oh, that's very original. It's the first time I've ever heard that one. Um, so here we go. So what I, I want like to do tonight, and, and it's a little different than maybe some of the things that you, you're hearing from, from some really great speakers that you've had, seemingly looking at the list from high school to college to NFL to you know, some of the, the, you know, Dean Blandinos and Mike Pereira's of the world. Um, but I'm not going to talk about balls and strikes at all. And Dennis is probably bored to death of this, this talk that I give because he's, he's heard it twice already, I think. And uh, so apologies, Dennis, hopefully for everybody else, it's something new. And given that it's not that large of, a, of an audience, please feel free to, you know, stop me or ask a question or I talk very fast. 
and apologies for that. So you may not be able to get a word in edgewise, but just interrupt me. You know, it's a small group, so it, it can be informal. And um, what I'll do is I'll kind of tell a, a little bit of history, lead in with a story. And then like what I like to talk about is what I call the five most important tenets of officiating. I do say that there's five so that you know when I'm going to be done. <laughs> so you can follow along because after all, I am a hockey league and I do like to hear myself talk. So there's five important tenets of officiating that I like to talk about. But yeah, as Dennis said, um, or, or didn't say, but I grew up in Tempe, Arizona, uh, went to, played high school football there and ran track, then moved on to Southern California where I played small college football and ran track and began getting right out the gate uh, after college. And one thing that I fell in love with about officiating in general was the diverse nature of the officials when I started my Southern California local group and by diving there and or, you know, great race or sociodemographics, although that was, you know, a, a good diversity as well. But what I really mean was there's there was guys who were brand new and just getting started, started out that wanted to advance and, you know, wanted to, to move to higher levels. And there were some guys who were 30 years at the high school level and were, you know, had no intention of advancing. But the commonality, at least in the association that I that I was in, and, and I'm, I like to think it's the same everywhere, was the desire to get better, the desire to improve and continue to, you know, hone your craft and, and just simply in, increase the quality of the product that we're presenting on the field. I'll say one of the probably three pet peeves that I'll say tonight, and it was a pet peeve that I learned early on um, when I had a referee say something to the effect of, you know, this is my field, right? This is my field, you know, kind of in a combative way toward a coach or a player. And, and I said right there, I gave pause and I said, no, that's not true. This is not our field. This is the field that belongs to those players, those kids, rather, those coaches that are spending their blood, sweat, tears, you know, at what they find their passion in and they're putting every day in practice. And, you know, there's nothing more important in a kid's life than a football player on Friday night, right? When he's playing under the lights and the goal of the five things that I talk about is to improve the quality of the product that which we put on the field for those kids, right? And at the end of the day, whether it's Pee Wee or high school or junior college or small college, major college or the NFL, that's the goal is to increase the, the quality of the product so that we can promote the, the fairness and selfishly stay off sports center, right? So uh, that was kind of one thing early on in my, in my officiating career. I worked high school and then I worked, uh, I moved on to junior college. And in 2004, I was hired by Jim Blackwood. So if you don't know Jim Blackwood, he's just an absolute God and, and the, the grandfather and godfather of officiating in my mind. Um, and, and then and I moved on to the Big 12, uh, working under Walt Anderson as a back judge, and then on to the Pac-12. And I don't mean to give you my resume other than to lead into kind of the opening story uh, that will kind of encapsulate some of the five tenets of, of officiating that, that I hold most dear. Um, 2011, Mike Pereira came to me, and he was at the time uh, kind of running the Pac-12, if you will, though Tony Correnti was the supervisor. And Mike hired me, and it was a hard decision for me to leave the Big 12 and join the Pac-12 for m several reasons, but mainly I had just worked the Orange Bowl as a back judge. Walt Anderson was very good to me and a phenomenal teacher that I had uh, learned an immense amount from, and it was just a difficult decision. At the end of the day, though, it was hard and, in fact, impossible to pass up a white hat in a major college conference. So I joined the Pac-12. Tony Karenny was a supervisor at the time, and... And Tony had something that he liked to talk about called nuggets. And what a nugget was in Tony's mind was these things that the referee could come on the microphone and announce that might help the crowd, might help the players and the coaches, might help the announcers get to the right direction, might help, you know, grandma and grandpa on their couch at home kind of demystify some of the things that we do from an enforcement standpoint that we do on the field and just kind of help them get in the right direction and educate them, if you will. So we had something called the Pac-12 was UC Davis at Arizona State. Now, UC Davis at Arizona State was for me the absolute Super Bowl, right? There was, you know, 100,000 people in the crowd, another 100 million people watching on television. And, you know, every single person that I've ever met from childhood was gathered around some television at some bar somewhere watching this UC Davis at Arizona State game in my mind. Now, in reality, there was probably 20,000 people in the crowd and maybe there was closed circuit television and, you know, all the people that I knew since childhood have long since forgotten who I was or who I am. But in my mind, I'm working the Super Bowl, UC Davis at Arizona State. 
If you've ever refereed before, especially on a microphone, you know that getting that first announcement out of the way is kind of the, you know, let's just, you got to get it out of the way. It, nothing starts until you get those nerves out of getting that first announcement out of the way. Well, we literally went about a quarter to a quarter and a half without any announcement in this game. And it's one of those where it's like, come on, a foul, something, you know, a false start, anything. Just let me get on the mic and get these nerves out. Well, finally, early in the set, the, the ball carrier was running with the ball. He got hit, his helmet came off, and he continued to run. And, and as we know, at all levels of officiating, uh, you know, we're, we're going to kill the play, we're going to shut it down, and we're going to bring it back in, bring the ball back, and, um, you know, we're going to kill the play. You know, by rule, when the runner's helmet comes off, the play is dead. Well, I saw this as a perfect opportunity to give a nugget. You know, people don't necessarily know why we're shutting it down, even though it's kind of obvious the guy's running with his helmet off. So I said to myself, all right, Sean, here you go. This is your first announcement in major college. Just get on the mic by rule. When the runner's helmet comes off, the play is dead. Easy enough, right? So I post up and I'm nervous. And this is my first referee assignment, my first announcement. And it's a pretty easy announcement to make. And right before I click the mic on, I realized that there's 100,000 people in the crowd watching me, 100 million people watching on television, and everybody I've ever known since childhood watching on, at a bar somewhere gathered around a really large te television. I click the mic on, by rule, when the runner's helmet comes off, the play is dead. By rule, when the runner's head comes off, he is dead, which, of course, <laughs> caused a big chuckle in the audience. And, and by the way, I should stop there and say that's absolutely true, right? They're, by the laws of biology or physiology or whatever, if his head comes off, he's dead. So I didn't say anything inaccurate. Nonetheless, I was mortified, right? And, you know, there were some chuckles in the crowd, like I say, and correction by rule when the runner's helmet comes off, the play is dead. And I went on and I was mortified. And of course, in my head, you know, Tony's going to meet me in the locker room after the game. He's going to say, Sean, you know, you just didn't have it. You really tried hard, but you just didn't have it. Thank you. It's a lighthearted example of something that I'm going to talk about. And Tony obviously didn't fire me and the rest of the game went off well and, you know, the, the, the season went off okay. But it's a lighthearted example of some of the five, and you'll hopefully understand why when I'm done, some of the five important tenets of officiating that I like to talk about. So thank you for listening. So number one, and in, in, in my eyes, the most important, at least on, on the field, become the go-to. I'm going to say it again because it's so important. Become the go-to guy. What is the go-to guy? If you've ever refereed, you know that there is instinctively one person on the crew that you look to when the chips are down, right? When you're conferencing over something and you hear the, feel the jeopardy clock in your head and you're not really sure about the enforcement or at least you want some confirmation of, you know, what we're doing is the, the right thing to do or not. You instinctively, human nature-wise, look to one, you know, as a crew member and as a crew mate, um, or as a crew leader, rather, you trust and respect everybody's rules, official rules, ability on the field. But human nature is at the end of the day, when it really, really matters, you can look to one person. I always wanted to be that guy. And fast forward thing about, um, uh, uh, well, rewinding to mid-career when I was on a crew with Greg Burks, in the Big 12 one year, there was a game, a game in particular, where I remember vividly, Greg looked up and he looked at me for the answer. And I said to myself in that moment, you've arrived, right? Like you are the guy, at least for this play of this game. And I, I ignore the, the nagging thought in my head that he was actually looking over my shoulder at Gene Simcoe or George Gusman looking for the real answer. But in that moment, I was the go-to guy. How do you become the go-to guy? So I was a track runner in high school and college. And I, and I also played football, but I secretly liked track more than I did football. I never told anybody at the time, but I secretly liked track and field more than football. And football was my love, right? I loved track because it was an individual sport. It was you against the clock. There was a true objective measure of improvement. You couldn't hide behind anybody. You couldn't blame, any, blame anybody. And it was a direct result of your success on the, in the meets was a direct result of how much work you put in at practice. And, you know, I, I, I say this, and this is gonna be controversial, and I realize we're recording, but this is gonna be something hugely controversial. But in my mind, in all of sports, the biggest gut checks 
are things like the 400 meters, the 800 meters, the 1600, the 400 meter hurdles, and all due respect to anybody who swam or swims or any other individual support. But my experience was track and on the track, those middle distances were total gut checks. You know, you couldn't necessarily just be a natural 100 meter, you know, sprinter and be good at the, the half mile or the quarter mile. You couldn't necessarily be just a great, you know, endurance guy and be good at the half mile and the quarter mile. It was kind of the merge of, of both of those. And I ran the 300 meter hurdles and the, and the 400 meter hurdles, as it were, in, in, in other states. And I always knew that, all right, here we go. Oh, Dana, Dana, you ran the four and the eight. I love it. But wonderful. I always knew that the, one of the things that I loved about track was, again, if I put in more work and I could, as I would call it, internalize more pain, if the, I know that's weird, but internalize more pain or internalize more kind of, you know, uh, 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 let's call it pain, then I would be better than the next guy. And the thing about track and field was the next guy is me a week ago, right? Like the next guy, the guy that I'm pe competing against was my time a week ago. And I know that if I put in more work than that person, I'm going to improve against that person. And if I continue to improve, you know, the rest of the field, I'm naturally going to advance on. But the person that I was most interested in beating in practice was, is the guy from a week ago. So the great thing about track and field was the objectivity. We would do something in practice that, you know, a lot of you can, can kind of relate to, and Dana's chiming in there and I love it, is we would run things like, you know, a pyramid where you go 300, 400, 500, 600, 500, 400, 300, just an absolute death of a gut check, right? Like one of those things where you can hardly, if you've ever done it, you know that you can hardly get out of a practice without throwing up. And that all of those times where I wanted to quit, right? And I wanted to give up. I would tell myself, hey, the guy a week ago, Sean at practice a week ago or yesterday or whatever would have done one more. So you've got to do one more. And that's just how you would push yourself. And, you know, I'm, I, I don't profess to be Kobe Bryant here or Michael Jordan with just that absolute killer instinct of a, of an athletic uh, uh, mentality, but that's what I would tell myself on the track. Fine. How does that relate to football officiating, Sean? We have a case book which is a collection of case plays, a collection of play examples. I'm, I'm sure the NF, NFHS has a similar book. There's 897 case plays in our case book. I know there's 897 case plays because I've read them all so many times, I'm sure I could practically recite them. And it sucks to read 897 case plays. And I've read them so many times. I try and read them five times, the book five times in the regular season or during the season, five times in the off season. I'm OCD. I'm a little bit neurotic and, and a little bit weird as you've already probably learned. But how I would read the case book is I would take a yellow highlighter and I would highlight every single word that I read with the goal of literally highlighting the entire book, including the copyright. I would do that in yellow. And then I would do it again in orange. And then I would do it again in pink and again in blue and again in another color that's darker than blue. And when I'm done with those five times, I'd throw the book out, reprint it and start over. And it would tell my, it was my neurotic OCD way of just knowing that I actually read that word is the reason that I would highlight it, right? So people would see my book and they think I was crazy. Now I've had people tell me that, oh yeah, I read that case book, you know, in my five hour flight home from, you know, my game. No, you didn't. In my mind, no, you didn't. Not with giving it true justice, you didn't, right? Because in my world, in my way of doing it, each case play takes about two to three minutes, right? There's 897 case plays. I'm going to spend three minutes roughly on each case play. That's a, just short of 2,700 minutes. It's about 44 hours. So to give the case book true justice in my mind, I'm, it takes me about a month and a half. And it takes me three minutes per, per case play because First, I'm going to read it and understand the answer and truly understand the answer. And that might involve flipping open the rule book and going to, you know, illegal batting and kind of figuring out illegal batting again and then doing a couple what ifs in my head. And what if there was a fumble on this play? And what if, you know, there was also an offensive holding? And what if, you know, there was a turnover on the play? And just kind of doing these what ifs and spending three minutes per case play. Well, I say that because it's really dry and really hard to read 897 case plays at three minutes per case play. Reading the rule book sucks. 
watching video over and over of offensive holding or defensive pass interference is really hard, right? It's really just takes a lot of discipline to stay in there. And that's internalizing pain, right? If I can read the mechanics manual, read the rule book, whatever your, your kind of study method of choice is, it's, it sucks. Like, let's be honest, right? It's really dry. And so it's one of those things where I would literally tell myself as I'm reading the case book, you know, the other guy, whether it's me a week ago or whether it's the other 16 referees in the NFL that I'm competing against, they're doing 10 more. So I'm going to do 11 more and I'm going to push myself. And that was how I tried to, to become the, the, the go-to guy. I would rewrite the rule book when I first started out. And by rewrite the rule book, I mean literally sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil and start at page one of the NFHS book and write every word. And again, my OCD is coming out, but it would tell my brain, hey, you're doing, you know, you're, you're, you're reading every word, hopefully also absorbing it. A gentleman by the name of Tom Hill, if you've ever heard that name, he lives in Florida, he's a Northeast guy, is the go-to guy on my crew. And everybody knows on my crew that Tom is the go-to guy because I tell them, right? I present that as a challenge at the beginning of the year this year. I'll say, hey, right now, Tom's the go-to guy. And the challenge for everybody is to supplant him as the go-to guy. And by the way, I should, I should pause and say, by go-to guy, I'm speaking of the general, you know, human. It could be a go-to girl. It could be a go-to whatever. But the go-to guy is how I've, I've coined it. So Tom Hill's the go-to guy on my crew. Um, so let me tell you quickly about Tom Hill. He's a 25-year NFL veteran. He's worked three Super Bowls. He's worked eight to 10 championship games. I don't know. He's an absolute god. He has accomplished it all. The guy is a rock star. Um, and he's the go-to guy on our crew. I challenge the guys all to supplant him. Week 17, a couple weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, a couple years ago, we're uh, in our week 17 game, the last game of the regular season. This particular game means very little to the teams because both teams are out of the playoff hunt. So they're playing for pride and next year's positioning and, you know, that kind of stuff. But from a playoff standpoint, game means very little. To us, from a grading standpoint, the game means very little because we don't get graded in week 17. You know, it means a lot in terms of pride in your job, et cetera, but we don't get technically graded in week 17. So if there was ever a game to mail in, this is the game. Week 17 in a non-effective, non-playoff, consequential game um, at the end of the season. I get to the host city and I get to the hotel and I, I go up to Tom's room as I often do. I'll just kind of go to one of the guy's rooms and chit chat uh, the night before the game. Um, and I knock on Tom's door and I walk in his room and there on his bed is the case book and the highlighter. And I say to myself, and I'm a rookie referee in the NFL and I say to myself, oh my goodness, like this is a 25 year rock star of a veteran who has accomplished all of it. And he's sitting here the night before an essentially meaningless game for the teams. And he's studying the case book and in whatever manner he does with his highlighter, he's studying his case book, just like he would week four, or just like he would have season four of his career. And I said to myself, if he can do this, there's absolutely no reason that I'm not putting in just as much work as this guy. Right. And that, that, and I realized that, you know, it's an interesting thing because He's at the top of his career and he's doing those things. But in my mind, the reason and the way that he got to the top of his career was because he was doing those things. So number one, become the go-to guy. You're a good audience so far. Number two, step off the ledge. I worked uh, 12 years of arena football and my very first arena football game was in Bakersfield, California, the Bakersfield Blitz. And they were playing the Central Valley Coyotes, I believe, Central Valley and Bakersfield. Ron Baines was the supervisor of the um, Arena Football League. This is the Arena 2, which was kind of the uh, um, minor leagues of Arena 1, if you will. And he was at the game. He was at this, this, this game. My dad was also at the game. This is in Bakersfield, California. And in my mind, this is the Super Bowl, right? This arena probably couldn't fit it, but somehow they jam packed 50,000 people into the, into the stands. You know, there's 50 million people watching on TV naturally. And everybody I've ever known since childhood was huddled around that same humongous TV at that same bar somewhere, somewhere else in the world. It's the Super Bowl. Now in reality, 
I'm not quite certain that the city of Bakersfield knew that there was an arena football team. So there was a smattering of fans. Uh, television was maybe somebody's iPhone was the, the best, the, the, the most we had. And again, those people from childhood, they, they have no idea who I am. So, but again, it's the Super Bowl. In arena football, there's something called the one minute warning. And the one minute warning is the same as the two minute warning in the NFL. When you get down to the end of a half, uh, you stop it at the one minute warning. We come together, we do our checks and our discussion and whatnot, and you move on. This is my first game. And again, Ron Baines is in the crowd. My dad's there as well. And we're getting close now down toward one minute and we're at about 107 and I'm sitting there and I know because I'm trying hard to be the go-to guy and know the rules so well. I know that there's a one minute warning. As soon as we hit one minute, we're shutting the game down. So I got my whistle in my mouth. It's one of those situations though, where the team's in the huddle and they're breaking the huddle and there's at 107, 106, they're coming to the line of scrimmage, 104, 103. And are they going to get the snap off before the clock hits one minute or not? And you know, those moments where you're looking at the clock, looking at the snap, looking at the clock, looking at the snap. I got my whistle in my mouth. I'm ready to go. I'm ready for the one minute warning. 102, 101, it hits one minute. And for that split second, I don't hear any whistles, right? And I'm sure of it. I'm positive this is the one minute warning. So I get on the whistle hard. I come rushing in. This is just as the quarterback snaps the ball, but I'm sure that the clock hit one minute before the ball got snapped. I come in hustling and I'm, oh my goodness, I saved the crew. I'm the only guy who caught this. I mean, the, what would have happened? The Arena Football League might have folded in that very instance if I wouldn't have shut down the game for the one minute warning, right? I'm, I've saved the crew. Ron Baines is going to meet me in the locker room. He's going to put his hand out and say, Sean, good job. Welcome to the NFL, right? My dad's going to be in the background crying tears of pride, et cetera. It saved the crew. So I come in hard and I come to Mike Westlow, who was the referee on the crew. And I say, Mike, he says, what do you got, Sean? I say, Mike, it's the one minute warning. Mike looks at the clock. He looks at me and he says, Sean, it's the first quarter. <laughs> There's no one minute warning in the first quarter, right? It's the end of the half. So again, I have one of those moments that I'll have again, 10 years later when Tony Carrente is about to fire me. And I go back to my position with my tail between my legs half expecting Ron Baines to pluck me out, you know, right there in that moment and say, Sean, you tried hard, but you just weren't good enough and send me home. I get to the locker room after the game and Ron's there and I'm kind of downtrodden. And he says, good job, Sean. And I say, God, Ron, thank you. But I can't believe I shut down the gate, the one minute warning in the first quarter, right? And he looks at me and, and in just a fantastic spin, because he should have fired me on the spot, but in a fantastic spin, he says, Sean, you know what you did? You stepped off the ledge. He says, you were confident that you had what you knew you had, one minute warning, you shut it down, you came in, you didn't wait for somebody else to come in and save you. You had the confidence to step off the ledge and come in. And we, that's what we want to see. We want to see the confidence in people that A, they know the rules cold to the point where they're confident enough to make that kind of a call. And B, they're willing to step up, step up and step off the ledge when they're not sure or when, when nobody else does and when, even when they're not totally sure that they're, that, they're, that they're correct. What we talk about on my crew is something about your responsibility. It's, it, it's not just a kind of cool, neat thing if you step up and save the crew. It's your responsibility if you have any doubt at all that something we're doing is incorrect to shut it down and come in or shut it down, bring it up on the O2O system, um, it, which is our way to communicate with the earpiece, shut it down and come in. It's not just, you know, oh, cool, you did that. It's your duty. It's your responsibility. And I don't care if you're wrong 99 out of 100 times. Now, your supervisor might care if you're wrong that often, but it's that one time out of 100 when you're right that we didn't go five instead of 10, that the chains are wrong, that the clock is incorrect, that, you know, anything. These days, at any level, I don't care if it's the NFL college all the way down to pee peewee, officiating is under more scrutiny than it's ever been and more criticism than it's ever been. There's too much on the line. There's too much at stake. There's too much, you know, just critique for us to not get things right. So it's your duty to step off the ledge, shut the game down, and come in. The back judge and, and well, two things. Number one is the days of, and this is number two of Sean's pet peeves, right? The days of 
the referee shooing you away because he's upset that you shut down his game with your question that you turned out to be wrong on because the clock's actually correct. Those days are gone. Like, and I mean that with everything that I have, that, that, that those days are gone. Shut it down, come in, too much at stake anymore for us to get it wrong. I don't care if you're wrong, 99 out of 100, just bring it up and come in. The back judge, kind of a separate step off the ledge situation is if there's any back judges on the call where you've got that punt that's muffed by B and picked up by A and he's running the other direction. Well, he thinks he's scoring a touchdown. The guys who are chasing him are trying to keep him from scoring a touchdown. The coaches on each sideline, the announcers, the fans, the people are watching at home and probably some of the other officials all think that he's scoring a touchdown. But none of them know, the officials probably just didn't see it, but none of those other people know that the rule is that if B didn't possess it, A can't advance it, right? And it's really hard. Again, I don't care if there's 100 people in the crowd or 100,000 people in the crowd, it's really hard to be the one guy who's going against the grain and saying, no, 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 it's dead here, he can't advance it. And when I see back judges drift back to the goal line and follow that guy because they're not sure, it's one of those things where, man, you got to be the go-to guy and know that rule lock solid, and you got to be able and willing to step off the ledge even when it's hard and shut that thing down. So number two, step off the ledge. Number three, figure it out. And this is something that I talked with my four-year-old who, if you were uh, here before the call started, he was hanging on my neck. Talk to him a lot. I have a two-year-old who we haven't started talking about these kinds of lessons uh, yet. And I have a three-month-old who, you know, he, God knows he doesn't know what he's getting into. But I talk to my son a lot about figuring it out. And in his life, what figuring it out means is those moments when, you know, I don't know, he, last night he couldn't find his knee pads because he wanted to go bike riding. And he ended up just sitting down and, and, and whining about it, right? Or, you know, this morning, the, the, the water bottle that, that we get water, the water dispenser was out. He couldn't reach it because it was too high. And so he decided he wanted to sit down and say, I can't do it and start to whine and cry about it. And those are the moments when I sit down and say, in what I feel is a nurturing, nurturing manner, hey, dude, like, we just got to figure this out. Like, there's a solution here. Let's just go over the solutions. Your knee pads? Let's look, dude. Did you look, you know, did you look throughout the garage? Let's go look. The water, I've seen you pull the chair out and step up before and get the water. You can reach it. We've just got to figure it out because nobody's going to come and help us in life, help us figure these things out. We have to do it for ourselves. And, you know, whether the, the kind of lessons resonate with him yet or not, I don't know. I have two nieces and forgive the, the one more family story, but I have two nieces. One of them lives in Tempe, Arizona. And at the time of this story, she's 19. Her name's Taylor. The other niece, Emily, is 14 at the time of this story. And she lives in Jakarta, Indonesia. So Taylor, the 19-year-old's in Tempe. The 14-year-old Emily's in Indonesia. My mom calls me one day and she says, Sean, I just got off the phone with Taylor and she's distraught. And I say, all right, mom, what's going on? She says, well, she couldn't, she couldn't get to work. So she calls me up and she says, Grammy, as she calls my mom, I can't get to work. My car's broken. Can you take me? And my mom says, I can't. I'm, I'm busy doing stuff. Can one of your friends take you? She says, no, I, all my friends are at work, Grammy. They, they can't take you. She says, can you fix the car, Taylor? She says, no, I, obviously I can't fix the car, Grammy. She says, can you call an Uber? Grammy, Taylor says, no, Grammy, I don't have any money. I can't call an Uber. Can you ride your bike, Taylor? No, Grammy, my, my tire's flat. I, I just can't ride my bike. Taylor, can you walk? Grammy, it's 110 degrees. It's 115 degrees out. I can't walk. How far away is your work, Taylor? It's a mile and a half. By the end of the conversation, my mom says, Taylor is sitting on the ground crying, distraught over the fact that she's going to get fired because she can't get to work a mile and a half down the road. Now, that's a true story. The hypothetical story is the 14-year-old who lives in Indonesia. At the time, I remember saying to my mom, I have the utmost confidence that Emily, the 14-year-old, and it's Muslim third world country could get from Indonesia to Tempe, Arizona to my mom's house if she absolutely had to by herself, right? And it might be a little bit exaggeratory, but she could, you know, get on one of those tuk-tuk things and find her way to the airport and beg for money and do the unaccompanied minor thing and, you know, land at Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport and, you know, find some way to get to Grammy's house ten, the rest of the 10 miles. And I, I, I think that sometimes, and, and I want to make sure that I'm very clear about this. I love both of my nieces to death, and they're both very successful at the, what they do in life. And Taylor has overcome those early years and is now a wonderful mother of two. 
of two kids and Emily's in college and I love them both dearly and they're both going to be huge successes in life. But one of them at that time was going to sit on the ground and cry about the reason she couldn't get to work. And the other one was going to figure out a way to get from the, the third world country to Tempe, Arizona by herself if she had to. That's in my mind, figuring it out. And that was, how does that relate to football officiating, Sean? That was one of our crew mottos last year was let's figure it out. Again, it goes back to the, that, that, that mindset that there's too much at stake anymore. There's too, we're under too much scrutiny and too much critique. And you know, everybody at all levels loves, loves to criticize officials these days. We got to get it right. Those times when you're conferencing, when you're not quite sure, that time when you, nobody knows if he got hit in the head or not, or what the clock should be. There's somebody on that crew that knows the answer that's gonna get, get us out of this situation and get us out of this mess. And it might be that the guy was hitting the head on this side of the field and, and somebody from this side of the field saw it and is willing to step up and come across the, the, the field and express his opinion. Or somebody saw the clock stopped or didn't, clock, didn't stop. And they're either gonna take that to the locker room or to their grave, or they're gonna step up in that moment and help us come figure it out because there's always somebody that has some clue about it. And the people that are gonna help us figure it out, the people that are gonna step off the ledge, the people that are gonna be the go-to guy and help us in those moments are the people that I wanna work with, period. Because again, as kind of an, as an aside, if you figure it out, if you step off the ledge, if you be the go-to guy and you work on these other two things that I'll talk about, to me, the balls and strikes come. And to me, you're gonna advance if that's your goal, you're gonna be a better official at the level you're at if that's your goal. So figure it out. Otherwise, if not, we're going to be on Sports Center. A really quick final figure it out story. I was I was lucky enough, as Dennis said, to work a playoff game this last year, a divisional game, uh, Houston at Kansas City, and Tony Correnti was the alternate on the game. And and Tony was just there, I'm sure, to babysit me, right? Because this game was sandwiched between Tony's play or a wild card game and his conference championship game. This was the divisional round, and Tony was the the alternate. We both live in Southern California, so we traveled together. Well, there was a huge snowstorm, and we had to go in a day early, and I advised the rest of the crew to come in a day early. Well, the NFL isn't an organization where they're going to call you and say, hey, Sean, you know, check the weather report. Hey, Sean, check the, you know, check your route. Maybe you should change it to this route. Hey, Sean, you should go in a day early. They just say, hey, you got a game at su on Sunday at one o'clock. You got a pregame meeting at three o'clock. Figure it out. Just get to the game, right? And Tony and I, as it ended up, you know, it was a full plane, trains, and automobiles um, uh, situation. But at the end of the story, we ended up flying into St. Louis, which is five hour drive from Kansas City and driving through a, a total snow, driving snowstorm in the middle of the night, no exaggeration, at about midnight to 5 a.m. to get to Kansas City. You just got to figure it out. And I'm sure everybody to some degree, especially living in the, the, the wild weather of New Mexico, has some kind of you know, similar story where you were in a situation where you had to get to a game and there was traffic or there was you know, weather or whatever, and you just figure it out and you get there. Number three, figure it out. Number four, overcome sudden change. I had a football coach in college who would talk about the, one of the true marks of character of an athlete is his or her ability to overcome sudden change. And what does that mean? I was a defensive player in, in college and you know, it was one of these you know, time sustaining drives where you know, the defense is on the field and the offense is just marching down slowly, just you know, first down after first down in a seven minute 14 play drive or whatever. And you know, you're just sucking wind and you're dying and you're trying to put up a fight. You get down toward the goal line and it's fourth down. And again, you're winded and just want to quit. And you have, you know, reminiscent of running that pyramid on the track and, and, and fourth down and you stop them, right? And you're euphoric, but at the same time, you're totally winded and you just need a drink and you got to get to the bench. And as soon as you sit on the bench, it's first and 10 and your quarterback throws an interception and your coach turns to you and says, you guys are back out there. Let's go. That's sudden change. Right. And he would talk about the character of an athlete in large, in some part is the ability to deal with sudden change. I think of that in terms of football officiating, but I also think of that more importantly in life. Right. And it's very topical today. And my, you know, my, my prayers and my respect and love go out to anybody who's been affected by this virus. Um, whether it's a sickness or, God forbid, a death or a job change 
or even aside from what we're experiencing right now worldwide, just in life, if you've had, you know, D D Dennis's son served as an, in the military and I have nothing but respect for that gentleman, but, you know, military or not, if you've experienced any kind of, you know, personal tragedy or job train change or anything like that, you know what it's like to have to deal with sudden change, those things that affect your lifestyle, right? So it's more of a life lesson. And I hate to, you know, minimize that by boiling it down to officiating, but how does it affect, how is it applicable to officiating? We've all kicked a call. We've all done something that was bad or wrong on the field. And we have to find a way to move on. And that's one of the, the most common questions I get is how do you move on from a call that you've made when you know that you, you made the wrong decision. My dad, if, you, if you're familiar with any of his history, had a career changing or career defining or you know, just egregious mistake that he made in 2008 in the game between San Diego and, and Denver. And this was you know, a, the kind of mistake that I'm sure he has nightmares about today, right? It's, it's in some ways, I don't wanna say defined his career, but it's stuck with him. It's kind of always been attached uh, with him. I've asked him oftentimes some version of how did you move on from that when you made when you know that you just made a game defining game changing right team that wins affecting game, uh, mistake how do you move on from that and I don't mean in the next days and weeks and years what I mean when I that's a different story what I mean in this context is how would you work the next play right because how would you work the next play People don't remember about that game, but there was still some time left in the game and the other team, whoever it was, got the ball back and they had an opportunity to drive down and score. They didn't have much time, but there was a toe tap on the sideline that went to review. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, this toe tap, which really is probably meaningless because it's not going to you know, change the outcome. He's got to go over there and officiate that under the hood and come out and make this decision and, and continue to officiate where really he knows that the, the mistake that he made two or three or five plays ago is gonna have some detriment on the rest of his career and then he's gonna have to answer to and that he's gonna be you know feeling worse than anybody about, but, but this has affected the game. How did you work that next play, right? Because we often talk about if you don't forget about that mistake, it compounds itself and it starts to spiral and then you're going to make the next uh, even worse mistake on the next play. The answer to that question when I asked him that came in the form of a voicemail that he had given me four years earlier when I worked my first Division I football game. I was in the Western Athletic Conference and it was uh, University of Idaho at Boise State. And I'm sure that I still have this voicemail in some you know old Nokia flip phone in the bottom of a box in my garage somewhere, but I've memorized it. And the voicemail was, I'm here. I got the ticket. Thank you. And I'll tell you the one thing I tell my crew before every game, focus on every play like it's the only play in the game. Concentrate and by all means, knock their you know what's in the dirt. And I've taken out that one segment of that voicemail and always remembered it. Focus on every play like it's the only play in the game. And I often find humor in that statement sometimes when I really think about, daydream about what it would be like, bear with me for a second, if I did everything that I do in my week and study film from the previous week and answer the office and do the self grading and scout for the next week's game and take the office tests and read my one hour of casebook study, et cetera, I get on the airplane at 645 Orange, uh, flight out of Orange County. I get to the host city about three o'clock in order to get to my pregame meeting that I'm, I've been planning for all week. That's a three hour meeting on Saturday night. I go to the dinner with the crew. I wake up Sunday morning and I get to the stadium three hours early and the dogs sniff our bags for you know explosives. And we do all of the pregame stuff and talk to the coaches and the chain crew and the ball boys and the security detail there and the production meeting with television and we walk the field and we do the warm ups and you know we stretch and we run and we do all this stuff and then we get to the coin toss and we toss the coin and we kick off and it's first and 10 and they run a play and then the game is over right the game's over after that one play and we run to the showers we hustle them we get to the airport i get in the airplane and land at LAX at one in the or at midnight get in my bed at one in the morning and i start over and i do it all again the next week 
how much would you concentrate and focus if that game was literally only one play long? I would imagine that it would be an unbelievable amount of intensity and focus if that game was one play long, right? And so what I try and do in terms of overcoming those mistakes and overcoming sudden change is focus on every play, like it's the only play in the game, literally, and then multiply that by 150 or 160. I'll tell my crew on the O2O oftentimes, and I say maybe 15 times a game, I'll get on the, on the O2O and I'll say this play, just this play. And what they mean by now is that's a shortened version of focus on this play, like it's the only play in the game. And I'll say that, you know, in the second quarter with 12 minutes left, or I'll say it in the fourth quarter with two minutes left on fourth down. You know, I just want to continually get in people's heads. And that's a way of reinforcing in my head that we need to focus. Because as soon as you let your mind drift, that's when mistakes are made. And then when you do make a mistake, once you're focusing and harping on that mistake from the last play, that's when mistakes compound themselves. So I try, easier said than done. I get it. Easier said than done. But forgetting about the fact that the last play exists and forgetting about the, the fact that the next play exists is the way in my mind that you focus and overcome that sudden change of a bad thing that just happened to you or keep those bad things that happened to you. An interesting side note to that kind of one play game conversation is that it's probably the, the play is not going to come your way, right? Like, it's more than likely if the game was one play long, that it's nothing, you're not going to get any action. It's going to be a pretty easy play to work and it's not going to come your way. And I want to say two things about that before I move on. Number one is the good ones, the great ones, Tom Hills of the world, they want that play to come their way, right? They're begging for that one play game to be their toe tap in the back of the end zone that they just nail, right? They're, they thirst for that. And that, those are the good ones who are prepared, who are the go-to guys who are ready to step off the ledge, who can figure it out, who are well-prepared, and they want to embrace that, and they want it to come their way. The other contingent of people is people that don't want it to come their way because maybe they aren't as prepared as those things about those, uh, for those things that I just said, right? And I want to say this about that. People always know. And I'm not sure, forgive me if you guys work on crews on the high school level, but it doesn't matter, right? If you work on a crew, if you work just a different five people or six people, you know, on, on a Friday night, if you work in an association or a conference or you're just a group of people that you like to officiate with, doesn't matter. You're going to get a reputation and people are always going to know if you're the person that is begging for the game to play, to come, not to come their way because they haven't done the preparation during the week and then they know that they can probably skate in this one play game. So I'm hoping that nobody on this call, and I don't think that you are one of those people because you're doing the work right now just by listening to this weirdo talking about his you know, five favorite things, but people will always know. So how do you overcome sudden change is the, is the question. Well, like I say, you focus on every play like it's the only play in the game, easier said than done, and then you multiply it by 150 to 160, uh, 200 times. We're getting there. Number five, you guys are doing really well. Thank you. Number five, the crew is always the most important thing. And this is truly the most important of the five. The crew is always the most important thing. And it doesn't matter if you work on a crew or not. Your association is your crew. The 22 people on this call are the crew, or the 27 people on this call are the crew, at least for the next 11 minutes or 41 minutes or however long we go. You guys are part of my crew today, and I would do anything for you in this moment. The crew is always the most important thing. Why does that matter? So there was a little boy in here before a lot of you got on, and he was my four-year-old, and his name is Crew. Right? And it's not an accident and it's not a coincidence that his name is Crew. I handicapped the, four, the poor kid because people are always going to be asking him, you know, if, if he's Grew from Despicable Me or if he's Cruz or Colt or whatever. And I killed him even more because I named it with a K. Right? I started his name with a K. But the kid's name is Crew for a specific reason. To me, the word Crew means family. And family is the most important thing, right? And one day I hope that he'll see the power and the privilege in being named crew and how important that is to his life and his, to, to his father's life. The crew is always the most important thing because it means family. I tell my guys this, and we talk about this a lot. 
what happens on the crew stays on the crew and you have to live by that. Everybody says that, but do you really live by that, right? The good stuff in the same vein, the good stuff, share it with everybody. The bad stuff stays here. So Friday nights, Friday night games, Am I the person that works a Friday night game and goes to the pizza beer joint afterward? And I'm talking about the mistake that, that Sue made or that Joe made in the game. Or is that the kind of stuff that's going to die with me? And I'm sharing the good call that Sue or that Joe made in the Friday night game. Am I a shark who's talking behind people's backs about them? Or am I a person who's of true integrity and character? And again, is going to live by that motto of the crew is always first things that happen on the crew stay on the crew, even if it's only a one night crew because it's a Friday night game and we don't work to uh, work on crews. Save each other, protect each other, get it right, right? These are some of the things. And again, it all, it's all selfish for me because at the end of the day, the goal is to improve the product of officiating so that I, my name's not on Sports Center at the end of the night, right? Because of some mistake that any of us made, the Sean Hockey League crew is the worst one. So it's selfish, right? But at the end of the day, I'm, and I, you can see I'm an affectionate guy, I'm a loving guy, and I, I, my crew makes fun of me for how much, many times I tell them I love them or I appreciate them or whatever on the O2O or whenever. But I believe strongly that if we respect each other, we trust each other, we love each other, then we're gonna wanna help each other on the field. And that kind of environment that that creates is when Dennis saves me because I missed the guy's hit to the head and we stayed off of sports center or whatever high school's version of sports center is, right? We stayed out of Dana's, out of Dana's inbox, right? He helped me. He saved me. Well, guess what? I want to pay him back the next week. So I'm going to want to go out of my way to look out for him, if you will. And that brings me to that kind of the third and final your pet peeve, if you will, this whole nonsense about fishing in other people's ponds. Yeah, no, not for me. <laughs> like that's, those days are gone. I, and, and, I, and, and look, I get it, right? Like don't fish in other people's ponds means take care of your business, right? And I totally agree. Nothing I'm saying am I deterring from you have a job to do in your area of responsibility and Sean better do his job first and foremost before helping each other, uh, somebody else. But part of Sean's job after taking care of his keys and his area of responsibilities is to be cognizant and aware of what else is going on so that I can provide that step up opportunity to save my crew member. The days of don't fish in your own pond or out of your own pond or whatever it is to me are gone. The days of, oh, I think something happened over there, but I'm going to pretend I didn't see it or maybe I'll bring it up in the locker room or eh, it's not my key. It's not my area. It's not my guy. It's not my responsibility. Gone. It all comes down again to there's too much critique of officiating and we're under too much of a microscope at all levels to not get things right. We got to do what it takes to get it right. And oftentimes that's a crew member coming off the field and saving us. Um, I'm going to skip a, a story because we're running out of time a little bit. But to me, you know, one of these things that, you know, if I'm as a referee, if I ever lie to my crew, I've lost them. If I ever shit you know don't share something with them i've lost them if i ever put myself first i've lost them and there's times when you know um without going into specifics there's times when it's hard for all of us and that you know there's nothing special about me i promise you that you know and whether it's in your your career or your football officiating career or your job life or your home life with your wife and your kids or your husband and your kids there's times when that one of the lessons that my dad taught to me through a story that 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 we'll, we'll do later was that true character and true integrity is doing the right thing all the time, even when nobody's looking and especially when it's hard and especially when it hurts. And those are the kind of thing, how does that relate to crew? Those are the kinds of things that sometimes you'll find yourself sacrificing for your crew member that people don't know about, right? Especially sometimes if you're the referee, people don't know that you're sticking your neck out for them and you're not looking for, um, um, for recognition. You're not looking for somebody to pat you on the back. You're doing it out of the fact that the crew is always in your mind, the most important thing. And you're going to live by that no matter what, even when it's hard and even when it's hurt and when it hurts. So I'll say, you know, kind of in summation, and, and again, this is our crew today. This is my crew and I respect and appreciate and thank you all truly for having me because you know, again, I'll repeat it. We're the same. You know, if you were one of the 27 that weren't on this call in the beginning, there's no difference between you and me. You know, 
we, 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 yeah, I've gotten certain breaks along the way and I'm well aware of what my last name is. And that, that kind of thing, by the way, dropped off for me a lot of years ago when I knew I belonged where I am. But, you know, some of us get seen, some of us get opportunities, you know, and we move up, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. Some of us just work really hard and the cream, I believe strongly eventually rises to the crop. But I say all of that to illustrate that we're the same right? Getting yelled at by a parent versus getting yelled at by an NFL coach is the same to your emotional psyche, right? It still feels really bad. and We still really hate it, right? So anyways, um, the five things. Step off the ledge, be the go-to guy, overcome sudden change, the crew is always first, and figure it out, right? If you can do all five of those things, in my mind, you're going to improve with balls and strikes. And I know Land comes on here and talks about game management and you get some other balls and strikes conversations. And I would love to listen in on some of those talks because I need to learn. But if I know that if I work on some of those five things, then I'm going to become a better quality official, both on and off the field and with balls and strikes. And I'll say this, even if you hang up the, the computer today and you say, ah, oh, Sean was full of baloney, he's garbage. And you know, that was a waste of my hour. There's one thing that you absolutely cannot dispute from this conversation. If the runner's head comes off, that dude is dead, period. That's all I've got for now, Dennis. Yeah, that's true. He, he's dead. Um, <laughs> we appreciate it. So, Sean, um, you know, I listened to you. This is the fourth time in, oh, Lord. in the last month. You need to get a life, man. <laughs> I, I learn everything. I learn something new every time I, I hear this this uh, presentation. Um, it's great. That that's why I had to reach out to you and get you on here for for the high school officials and and some of the other officials listening outside of New Mexico because you have such a great presentation um, and message that that you um, provide and you don't realize how far this this goes to. The hearts of uh, high school officials. So, uh, thank you again. Of course. Uh, Dana, are you there? I sure am. Um, Sean, that was awesome. I really appreciated your message. Um, you know, we're talking a lot, of course, about that climate of change right now with everything going on with the coronavirus and, you know, not knowing if for having a season and all that and kind of the adaptability that it takes with officials. I appreciate the fact that you were you know, right on target with that. And, you know, everybody on this call who's an NMOA official knows how huge I am with the family aspect of officiating. So I really appreciate you talking about crew equals family because that's something that, that I kind of have had as my motto and mantra in my position over the, the, over the years. Um, really, thank you so much. I, your, your presentation was spot on and I just put in the chat room, my hand is numb because I took so many notes. So I will warn you ahead of time that I will be recycling some of this information right. and sharing it with officials of all sports because it applies, you know, in, in every sport we oversee. But um, it's just, it's amazing what you've shared with us. And I'm always just deeply honored when, when we have officials of your caliber sharing that and I know you said that we're all the same but you know it, it's always nice to hear from people who have made it to the level you have and I appreciate your your humility and the fact that you're so willing to share and I will remember if a guy's head comes off he's dead that that <laughs> had you rolling so I appreciate your humor as well thank you so much for spending your evening with us no absolutely my pleasure and Dana you were an 800 400 runner huh I was. My dad always. Uh, my dad always said it's because I'm such a stubborn person. That's why I love those races because, yeah. man, they're they're horrible. Yeah. I'm working back and with shot two shot knees. I'm like, I don't know how I did it, but I think it's helped me in my career a little bit, probably more than I more than I recognize. You got to have a little bit of moxie, and uh, it, it's been helpful. That's right. And Brad, I see Brad and DB ran some, ran some track as well. And no, thank you, Dana, for the message. And you're very gracious and I appreciate it very much. And truly for anybody on the call, reach out to me anytime. I mean, you know, there's times when obviously life gets busy, but if there's anything I can do, one of the questions I get a lot is, is how do I advance? And, and, I, and I say to people, I say, the goal, if you get into officiating with the goal of advancing or the goal of becoming an NFL official and you're going to quit, if you don't make it to the NFL, stop, right? And, and, I, and I say that because it's such 
such a hard road, obviously. Do it for the love of the, of, of the sport is a, or the reason that I hope you're doing it and the advancement will come. But, if, but in terms of advancing, the reason I brought that up is find a mentor, ask advice of people, you know, obviously put the time in like we're talking about, but everybody likes to give advice and just find a play and a reason and a situation that you have question on and, you know, grab onto somebody at the risk of being an annoyance. So I, I, I'm not volunteering myself necessarily to be everybody's mentor, but, but my point is that please feel free to contact me anytime. I'm an open book and I'm, and I'm, I'm very much happy to help and, and honored that anybody would, would, would think of even listening to, to the things that I have to say. Yeah, so, Thank you, Sean. Have a safe weekend. Appreciate your time. You Sean, bet. So before I let you go, there is one question in the chat room that was not answered sure. by, by Ty Friend. Um, oh, he's actually sitting in, in Arizona, but um, yeah. Yeah. There's uh, let's see what coach in the NFL or college you feel you had to have your stuff together uh, without giving specific names. There's certainly, you know, the, the coaches that, that are very good with the rules and, you know, all of them at least have somebody on staff who's, who's very good with the rules. So I'm going to punt that one just by saying at this level, it's, it's, they're all so professional that you really have to know your stuff. And I pride myself, if you will, at the risk of sounding whatever way this is going to sound, but I'd like to think that I'm the top rules guy in the league. Right. And I'm sure there's a bunch of other guys who want to claim that, that, that prize also, but I like to think that the work that I put in leaves me in a, puts me in a position where I'm going to know, and have a very confident answer about any question that a coach has. So without saying names, I'll say that anytime a coach that is extremely rules knowledgeable comes to me and has, and wants to ask a question, you welcome that challenge. You know, you welcome that challenge. And it's kind of fun to be able to talk rules with people that are, that are um, um, really knowledgeable. The special teams coaches in the NFL are a different breed because they, a lot of times want to, um, you know, kind of continue to look for creative ways to, you know, do a new onside kick, or whatever. So they're a bit challenging and fun, fun to deal with because it's kind of cool to see the things that they come with, up with. So I'd, Thanks, I'd say that. Thanks, yeah, you Scott. bet. And I think, I think that goes back to just being very prepared at all levels of officiating. Um, sure. So just so you know, there's one more question. We'll, if you have time, we'll take this last question. Sure. Um, um, and Luke, he's actually was here in New Mexico. He's now back East in Pennsylvania and he works for referee.com magazine so, so we, we got a lot of interest in in um in what we're doing here at different levels of officiating and yeah yeah and luke that's something that i think is happening a lot more right i mean you've seen the genesis of the of the rules gurus on tv of course and, and now i think a lot of teams are bringing in the ex-officials i don't know about college but the nfl does that quite frequently we'll have, they'll have the ex-nfl officials you know working on staff uh, for a variety of reasons and and hey i think that that's and you said it the challenges the the red flag challenges and stuff like that the, the analytics departments are growing in all of the teams in terms of studying you know kind of the effect the efficiencies of when to challenge and what to challenge etc um so that's becoming more and more a part of the game yes and then i'm assuming they're helping them with the rules as well so yeah i think that's going to only continue to grow great thank you sean and um with that uh, enjoy your weekend. Happy 4th of July and happy birthday. Thank you guys. Happy 4th. Happy 4th of July. And Dennis, and to anybody who served, truly a thank you um, um, from the bottom of my heart. And have a happy 4th of July. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Good night.